thank you for the warm uh, introduction and thank you for having me. Um, it's great to see all of you here. Obviously, the Iranian election um, holds such great promise and everyone's watching the space. What is this new president going to do? Is this going to be a break with the past uh, history of antagonism and conflict between Iran and the United States and the international community? So I have, my, I have a few um, ideas and um, thoughts I'd like to share with you, but I'd also love to hear from you, especially if you have uh, been visiting the country. I think some of you might have been visiting recently. I'd love to hear uh, how, you, uh, how you see the events unfolding. The very first thing I'd like to start with, Iranian political system is a bit of a mystery to uh, a lot of observers, including myself. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where the power resides, who holds the power. We hear of the supreme leader, we hear of the president, there's always tension between them, always, always tension between them. Um, so what's going on? I guess what I've tried to do here in this diagram is to bring some degree of you know, order into it so that we can see in, sch in schematic terms how different organs of the state relate to each other. Um, the left hand side of this slide is a familiar um, structure. We have the electorate, we have a president, we have a parliament. So far so good. We have what we have in the West as well. The right hand side of the slide gets a bit more complicated and that reflects the nature of the regime it reflects the Islamic Revolution. It, it goes to the very heart and essence of the Islamic State. The Islamic State is founded essentially on a contradiction. The Islamic Republic, and this is what I said <laughs> a few years back when I was here last time, and unfortunately this chart, this diagram has not changed since our last presentation. And that contradiction is based on the idea that we have a republic. We have people who vote. We, the population, the, the, of the voters, um, can decide who represents the, the, the electorate. We have a presidency, we have a parliament, republic. But at the same token, at the same time, we have this idea that sovereignty doesn't reside with people, but resides with God. And who represents God on earth is the Balayat al The notion of Balayat al which literally means the supremacy of the best learned, the most learned jurisprudent. The idea is that the most learned jurisprudent will understand the will of God and represent the will of God on earth. That's a supreme leader. So how do you bring these two conflicting ideas together? Sovereignty of the people, the electorate, and sovereignty of God. How do you bring them together? This is how they have tried to reconcile this tension and contradiction in Iran. You have an electorate set of bodies, elected bodies, and then on the right hand side you have a supreme leader who is not answerable to anybody, who makes direct appointments. Let's see if I can use this. <laughs> so the Supreme Leader who makes an direct appointment to the Head of State TV, the Security Council, Armed Forces, which makes him the Commander-in-Chief of Armed Forces, and also the Head of State in Iran. The Expediency Council, you'll hear a bit more about that later. The Judiciary and the Guardian Council. If you have followed the news on the election, you will note that this Guardian Council plays quite a central role in the way the system functions. The Guardian Council, that is half, it's a body of 12, 12 men, 12 um, experts, half of them appointed by the Supreme Leader, the other six appointed by the head of judiciary, who is in turn appointed by the supreme leader. <laughs> so this body of 12 men, 
and so all those men, no women there. <laughs> this body of 12 men has veto power over who stands for election. So you have a parliament, an elected body, but the, but the, uh, guard, the guardian council decides whether you can stand for election. It tests the loyalty of candidates to the idea of Islamic Republic, to the idea of Rawat al-Faqi, and it decides whether you are, you know, you meet the criteria to stand for election. So it's ideological criteria, not technical criteria. Um, the same, the same Guardian Council also has vetting power, so it also vets candidates who stand for election in the Assembly of Experts. Now this is a bit of a very strange beast because the Assembly of Experts, which is a large body, I think 88 people don't, in theory has the power to remove the Supreme Leader. And in fact, the Assembly of experts appoint the supreme leader. So hypothetically, theoretically, this assembly has a lot of power. But in reality, the supreme leader is a leader for life. Um, there is no indication that the current supreme leader will step down. The last one, Ayatollah Khomeini, who was the founder of the regime, uh, you know, died in office effectively. And um, And this whole, uh, this whole, the process of vetting effectively means that people who are loyal to the supreme leader, to the current incumbent, get a place on that assembly. So very much this is a closed system. It's very difficult to make change, bring change to this system from outside, because it, it is very much controlled environment. I think during Christian times, some of we might refer back to the experience of um, Khatami as president and his efforts to bring change and the difficulties that the reformist president faced when he had a reformist parliament uh, on his side. The difficulty is that the parliament might be inclined to reformist ideas as was the case during Khatami's first term. But resolutions passed by the parliament need to be approved by the Guardian Council <coughs> as in line with the ideals of the regime. And if they are found to be not in line, and if there is a dispute over them, there is a procedure, the parliament if it really wants to challenge the Guardian Council, can take the matter to the Expediency Council, this one. The Expediency Council is tasked with, with uh, mediating uh, disputes and conflict between various arms of the state. So if there is disagreement between the Parliament and the Guardian Council, the matter is referred to the Expediency Council which is in turn appointed by the Supreme Leader. So it's, it's very difficult to implement change where there are so many barriers. You have to really enforce change of personnel and attitude on a lot of levels, at a lot of levels, in order to materialize change on the ground. So let's, that's just a starter. I'm starting on a negative note, so I can get to the positive note. You might say that given this closed system, why do people bother? Why should anyone go and vote? What's the point? What's the difference? Even when you had a reformist president, namely Khatami, didn't really matter much because all the changes he put in place were rolled back 
very easily after he's after he stood down at the time of his office. But I think it's human nature to want change. It's human nature to be optimistic, even against impossible odds. And that's what happened uh, a couple of months ago in June in Iran, where the population, the electorate, all of a sudden got a moral boost when they saw that the number of people standing for election was well, one person, namely, namely Rouhani, looking quite promising. And given that he has been an insider, I'm going to come back to this, he has been an insider, and because of his past, that could somehow open up doors and possibilities. Do you want to take my jacket off? That's just a oh, bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. What? Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> You had 680 people nominating for elections. That number was vetted down to eight. <laughs> Two of the eight withdrew later. So we had six people standing. And it was really at the very last, in the last week of the electoral campaign that all of a sudden people thought, hey, maybe there is a chance for change. Until one week before the election, there was an air of um, pessimism among the population, among the electorate. Uh, people were unsure if they're going to vote. The regime was very concerned about voter turnout. That's why it had clumped together, clustered together a presidential campaign with municipal cam uh, presidential election and municipal elections, so to ensure a higher turnout to the election, to the ballot boxes. And it was looking quite shaky until the last week of the campaign. Last week of the campaign, one reformist candidate withdrew in favor of Rouhani. Um, with the um, with the blessing of two former presidents, Khatami and Rafsanjani, both of whom are seen to be reformist. And it was really that dynamic in the very last days of the campaign that got people excited. And the morale went high, and there was a high turnout at the ballot boxes. Um, 72% of the population voted, which is quite impressive. And Rouhani got the lion's share of the votes, which meant there is no need to go to second round of, second round of voting, which is again quite impressive. He got over nearly 51% of the vote. Qalibov got a distant uh, second, 16% of the vote, and a third one. I'll come back to the third one. And that picture is a picture of people in Tehran celebrating. You can see that the scarf of that lady is kind of pushed back, reflecting the jubilant mood in the streets of Tehran. And the sense of hope, the sense of hope that Rouhani is going to make a difference. Now, who is Rouhani? Rouhani has been part of the establishment from effectively day one. And perhaps until the last few days of the electoral campaign, he would have shied away from this label of being a moderate candidate. He has been a responsible candidate. He is Western educated. Um, he has opposed uh, Ahmadinejad, the current president's policies on a number of issues which he thinks are uh, irrational, aggressive, um, damaging to the interests of the Iranian state, the Iranian nation. So he's been trying to bring a degree of um, accountability, rationality into the, to the state. Uh, and he has campaigned on those points. But uh, despite those, he has not been a reformer. Um, he's been a responsible 
politician. Very much part and parcel of the uh, of the you know the highest echelons of power, as you can see. The reformist candidate who withdrew in favor of Rouhani um, has obviously a lot more credentials as a reformist. Uh, he prides himself as being an academic. Um, that's a, a lot more than being a politician. Um, he has also he also has credentials of being a revolutionary and part of the Islamic regime, but not to the extent as Rouhani is. And it was his withdrawal, Reza Arab's withdrawal from the campaign that really boosted. And in many ways, you might say this was quite a calculated move by the reformist camp to have a reformist run for the presidency and then withdraw at the last minute in favor of one so that there is no, so you don't split the vote. Whereas in comparison with the more hardliner, more conservative candidates, the vote was split between the remaining four. Qalibov came number two. He's an interesting character. Um, he has links with the um, Revolutionary Guards, which is now the you know, military in Iran. Um, he has um, run industries, commercial industries, commercial enterprises for the uh, for Pasdaran, the Revolutionary Guards. Um, he's the mayor of Tehran. And note that Ahmadinejad was a mayor before he became president, so he is quite well placed to uh, move from the, uh, the mayor office to the presidential office. But that background and those kind of support didn't make it for him, didn't quite make a difference for him. Um, he came second with 16% of the vote. He, Balibov has a bad name among the reformists because of his military past, because he is accused by a lot of the student association in Iran for being responsible for the separation of student movement in Tehran. Um, so uh, he, ha he has a very negative, negative image among the student body in Tehran. Jalili is an interesting character. For a while, a lot of the analysts in the West thought that Jalili was going to be the winner of the race. Of all the other candidates, he was the only one who tied himself quite closely with the Supreme Leader. In fact, his electoral campaign was about we believe in the Supreme Leader, therefore we vote for Jalili. Um, that might have probably uh, worked against him because the Supreme Leader did not endorse him. Uh, and that was noted in the public media in Iran, in, in the mass media, that there was no official endorsement for this candidate. So uh, that doesn't put him in a, in a, in a good light. And then the two other candidates, Belayati was a former foreign minister, um, close to the Supreme Leader, not a very exciting person. He is, um, you know, sometimes called as Mr. Maybe because, uh, because you know, he always said, maybe I'll do, maybe I won't, maybe I ask the Supreme Leader. He wasn't, he wasn't seen as a decisive um, character. Um, Rezai, again, uh, very, you know, leadership position in the Revolutionary Guards um, seemed to be very much a hardliner and conservative, didn't even um, register on the, um, on the vote. And Garazi, again, didn't even register on the vote. Again, very much part of the establishment um, on the conservative side, but no major achievement to really um, speak of. Now, these two people, Rafsanjani and Khatani, these two people are interesting. They are big players in Iranian politics. Um, Rafsanjani was a president, a former president, who tried to stand for election. He was among the 680 candidates who put their name up and was vetted out by the Guardian Council 
as not being suitable to run for president. <coughs> it kind of defies logic that the former president, who is currently serving on the uh, Guardian, who is currently serving on the Expediency Council, can be vetted out by the Guardian Council as not being suitable. Nonetheless, Rafsanjani has been a practical leader. Not necessarily a reformist leader, but a practical leader who um, has been, who has endorsed Rouhani's policy on um, responsible economic management and improving relations with the West. So he endorsed Rouhani and Khatami endorsed Rouhani. Khatami, I think, um, knew that if he put his name forward as a candidate, he would be vetted out by the Guardian Council. He didn't even bother. There was no point doing it. Um, but he, he does have a lot of influence behind the scenes among the reformist camp, in the reformist camp, and um, his endorsement of Rouhani really lent weight uh, to Rouhani's electoral campaign. That's um, a couple of statements on how Khatami and Rafsanjani sponsored and supported Rouhani. Both of them talking about how Rouhani can bring responsible government to the country. How he can make the government more accountable, more responsible, more you know, functioning um, on rational terms. And move away from the ir irrationality of Ahmadinejad's presidency. What does Rouhani stand for? Again, rationality is a big thing for Rouhani. Um, he has talked about how uh, civil rights are important in Iran, which is a bit of a taboo. It's difficult to talk about civil rights in a country that does not allow uh, you know, opposition political parties or civil society organizations. So he, he is, he is trying to move in that direction of being a reformist. Now that he is getting the vote of the reformist, he needs to present himself as a reformist. So he's making all the right, right noises here. He is distancing himself from the extremists, and that's what he has. Uh, that's that's what he said in an interview with the reformist newspaper. Um, he is um, again talking about. Allowing, this, allowing society to reclaim what, it, what rightly belongs to it and limiting the scope and the power of the government that interferes in every possible affair of the population. So, responsible government, not too, much, not too overpowering. In relation to the nuclear program, Rouhani uh, made, I think, made a statement that rhymes in Persian. I, I talked about how centrifuge is important. It's good to have centrifuge if it turns, but it's also important that the economy turns. And it rhymes in Persian, so it sounds better. <laughs> but the idea is that he is, he is linking Iranian nuclear ambitions with other concerns that Iran has. He is clearly concerned about the economic um, the, the economic welfare of the population. He's concerned about the economic downturn in Iran. Um, I think yesterday they were talking about 40% inflation. Um, sure. it, it's, it's, it's incredible uh, what's been going on. And a lot of it is due to the sanctions, obviously. <coughs> on foreign policy, again, he is... Um, going towards these taboo issues, and he's talking about talking to the United States. Why not? One point that has been central to the Iranian foreign policy making, foreign policy statements, Iranian, the, the Islamic sense of it itself in the international community, is that there is no justice in the world, that the United States is an overpowering imperialist superpower that controls all international institutions 
and they all work against Iranian interests. And you can't talk to an imperialist because they don't give you the right to talk. And if there is injustice in the system, Iran is going to exclude itself from this system, from this injustice. This, this belief has been central to the foreign policy making, to all Iranian foreign policy making, and this has guided the way Iran relates to its neighbors, Iran relates to international organizations, to the United Nations, and of course the United States. So Rouhani is not negating that idea, and it's important to bear this in mind. Rouhani is not negating, he is not disputing, he is not saying, no, 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 the international system is just. He's saying, if you allow justice, we are happy to talk. So he's kind of opening a bit of a window here. Let's talk, we are happy to sit down and talk, we'll even talk directly to you. But it, it needs to be on a, just, on a just basis. Which is a bit of an improvement with what we have, but it's not quite there. In relation to Syria, this is quite significant. Um, Rouhani, you, you will be aware that Iran has supported Bashar al-Assad. It has decided that the war in Syria is an imperialist plot against an anti-Israel force. Iran and Syria have been allies uh, since the beginning of Iranian state formation. And um, Iran has made it clear that it will support Bashar al-Assad. It won't let it fall. For the first time, Rouhani is talking about mediation. He's talking about negotiation. And that's quite significant because it implies that there may be legitimate concerns and legitimate demands raised by the opposition in, in Syria. And the Supreme Leader, casting his vote. <coughs> the office of the Supreme Leader is supposed to be above politicking, above daily politics. The other Supreme Leader is supposed to be kind of hovering over the state and not worry itself with the mundane affairs of running the state in Iran. That's how Ayatollah Khomeini saw it when he conceptualized and formulated that office, which was incorporated in the Constitution. But the current incumbent, the, uh, the, the current uh, Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, has moved away quite significantly from that model. In 2009, you will recall that he um, publicly endorsed Ahmadinejad. He um, congratulated Ahmadinejad as the um, victor of the presidential uh, election 2009, we, before the official uh, results were out. And he was so obviously <laughs> taking sides. Then, during Ahmadinejad's term in office in the past you know, three years, four years, uh, he has been in conflict with the president, he has been endorsing or re uh, disendorsing nominations for ministerial <coughs> office, ministerial posts, really getting involved in you know, who runs the office of communication, who runs this and who runs that, really bringing himself down to the level of local, you know, national pol uh, politicking and political imagination. And as a result, that office has lost a lot of credibility and legitimacy in the eyes of many people in Iran. Even those who support the idea of the supreme leader, the office and the notion of having a supreme leader, have lost confidence in Khamenei as the right supreme leader. And that's bad for him and that's bad for the regime. So perhaps, and this is my take on it, perhaps he has learned from that mistake in 2009. So with the last election 2013, June a couple of months ago, he's, 
he's um it's only last month <laughs> so a couple of months ago <laughs> he has tried not to take sides he has not made no public statements in support of a candidate he has uh, in fact there was an interview with him and he said not even my close family know who i'm voting for i'm not telling anybody who i'm voting for i'm just a person casting my vote like any other citizen of of, uh, of iran perhaps it's learned a lesson as perhaps it's that stepping back attitude that has allowed rohani to um claim victory because Rouhani's victory was very much a surprise. I, I can't think of any observer, including myself, who could foretell Rouhani's victory. He might have been a serious contender, but Jalali and Golibov, those two are probably a lot more serious than Rouhani. So I think with that, I conclude and uh, I'm happy to explore various angles and different tangents that um, you think is pertinent to Iranian election. Yeah.